come up to the game review. This is a big one for me today. I, I requested this one. And I can't, I can't disagree with it. We are reviewing Lorenzo Il Magnifico. Uh, if you looked at Matt's ratings and my ratings on The Geek, I think it's safe to say that neither of us have this below a 9.5. Uh, I have 10 games rated a 10. And that's one of them. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I have it as a 9.5. I don't know why I haven't moved up to a 10. Shoot, I have it as a 9.5 too. Hold on, let me fix that. Oh, there you go. And it's a 10. Now I have 11 tens. That's that, ridiculous. That's weird. I didn't yeah. know that you had it at that, but uh, yeah, I, I, had it at, I had it at a 9.5. But it is a 10, and especially after the expansion. We're going to be talking about not just the game, but we're going to be talking about the game plus the expansion. Um, plus the new little tiny expansion. Yeah, I, which I know nothing about, but yeah, I'm looking forward we'll to getting into it. So uh, let's get let's talk. Let's do the tail of the tape first. All right, uh, Lorenzo Il Magnifico uh, came out. What year did it come out? 2015. I, I believe, believe it's 2015. Uh, the art is by Clemens Franz, Andrea Katnig, and Andreas Resch, and it is designed by a group of people who, if there was a fantasy board game designer league, <laughs> and which there definitely should be. Every single one of these people would probably be in the top ten. Yeah, I can uh, I can give you some of their stats as I go. Down I'm there. I'm I'm You're about ready to, for this. I'm Hit totally me. ready to do this. Hit me. Flamina Brasini uh, not only designed uh, Lorenzo, but she also designed Coimbra. And I think it's uh, important to take a moment and and say she is a female designer. Female designer, amazing, amazing. Those two games alone would be would be you know a, a PhD status. Yeah. Coimbra in, and in Lorenzo, you you are in the Hall of Fame. Absolutely. Uh, Virginio Gigli uh, designed this. He also designed Coimbra, and he also designed Grand Austria Hotel, which is, uh, if there is a, a masterpiece that is a little bit more forgotten out of the group, I think that's well, the Well, that's it's funny one. because some people, this is their, like, they're, they're, I think of this, this, there's like four games in this genre, in this, tr this sort of world here. There's, there's Marco Polo, Lorenzo, Coimbra, and Grand Austria. Uh, I would definitely throw Zolkin into the mix. Yeah, okay. So, okay. and we get those five games. Um, for a lot of people, I think Grand Austria might be their favorite. I think that I think only in our group did for it. Sure. Yeah, like e even Jennifer uh, Schlickburn, who uh, we talked about last week on the she podcast, she did say that she likes. She, this is by far Grand Austria is by far her favorite, and Grand Austria is incredible and a game that actually I, I pulled off my shelf this week, and I was like, we need to play this more. Totally agree. It's, it's dang good. I, I I don't have anything negative it to say about out, Grand Austria. It came out like within within a year of Lorenzo, and just Lorenzo just eclipsed it for me. I think I said something last week about um, really truly great games. There's an alchemy to it, right? It's not science. At a certain point, there is. It's not just that the game plays wonderfully, but there's there's something kind of magical about the mix yeah. of the different elements. And just for me personally, Grand Austria Hotel is at the absolute peak of design, but the alchemy of it isn't quite doesn't sing to me quite as strongly as some of these other ones. Sure. Uh, but we need to get to the third and final designer of this game, and his name is Simone Luciani. Mm. And uh, holy what, cow! What hasn't been said about Simone Luciani? Is he is he the greatest game designer I of said, our this time? This is what I said during the barrage review. I said I think he's my favorite designer of all time. I think he is. I think he is. I think there's no way to say he designed Lorenzo Il Magnifico, which, as you will see, we he's are we are going to games, yeah. sure. As you see, and, and the great thing is, is that they do design in teams, in yeah. groups. They work together. They have kind of mm -hmm. a collective. There's no doing auteur this, theory here. Which is amazing. He designed Lorenzo Willow Magnifico. He designed Grand Austria Hotel. He designed The Voyages of Marco Polo. He designed Zolkin. He designed Newton. And, ladies and gentlemen, he designed Barrage. Yeah, he's, he's not messing around here. He came to play in this board game thing. This guy... This guy, he is like Babe Ruth. Yeah, no, it's stupid. It is. He is pitching. He is batting. He is knocking everything out of the park. It's unreal. Matt, why don't you tell us a little bit about Lorenzo and yeah. what it is? So the reason I wanted to talk about Lorenzo today was uh, this is my last episode as host for a little bit, a couple months, and I wanted maybe, to talk maybe about. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> I wanted to talk about what I think is, and because it came up in a couple of reasons. We talked last week about games that don't get the respect that they deserve. Now, you can't say that about Lorenzo, as it is the 106th highest ranked game on Board Game Geek. It's hard to say that it is uh, underrated. Well, well, I, but, but I, here's my point. It's criminally underrated. Totally agree. I'm going to say this right now. How is it on the top 20? Lorenzo Il Magnifico is the greatest medium weight board game of all time. Boom. I'm saying it. Said it. I'm saying it. Now, 
is I, is Marco Polo better? Is Grand Great Western Trail better? Is Zolkin better? No. They might be as good, but there is nothing better. And if I had to pick just one of the great medium weight board games, the great modern Euros of the medium weight style, I'm picking Lorenzo because I think it ticks all the boxes and I think it has the greatest replay value, mainly because I think it has the greatest expansion of all of them. And I love Great Western Trails expansion, but Great Western Trails expansion almost is a 2.0 to me. This is a true expansion in that it just, I would never play without it. I would say that uh, I would say this. I would say the Great Western Trail expansion takes an amazing game and fixes something that was not quite singing as well as it should. Sure, but it almost feels like a different. It almost feels like a sequel to me. Well, in fixing it, it f- almost forces you to do something that the yeah. previous game didn't have. Yeah, I could still see wanting to play vanilla Great Western Trail. I would never play vanilla Lorenzo. Nothing needs to be fixed in vanilla Lorenzo. Right, vanilla Lorenzo. Uh, is a perfect game. It is a perfect game. It really, really is. I don't mind playing basic. Uh, sure. Just at the con, um, there was uh, Jesse had never played Lorenzo, and I got it oh, out of crazy. the game library, and and we played it, and and we played it with Ben M, and we played it with Elder and him. Yeah. Uh, Elder had just gotten off of a twenty hour flight from Ghana. Yeah. And came directly to the con. Uh, play, we played that game and we had the best time. And it was vanilla because we were we, we didn't have the expansion. We, yeah. were, we were getting it out of the game library. Uh, what I love is that game. something also funny about this game is the, the, the publisher of this game is Simon Games, yep. which when I think brilliant, genius, medium weight euros, the the last Uh-oh. company that comes to mind is Simon Games. Uh, <laughs> this is the, the company behind Zombicide and Blood Rage and Rising Sun and Arcadia Quest and very fun games. Soon to be our sponsor. But... Um, just I was, They're you know, I, I think part of the reason this game didn't didn't blow up the way it should have, I think, is because it, you know, it, it was didn't come from, you know, Holland Spiel or something or some, you know, uh, oh, interesting. interesting. Uh, I think people sort of were like Simon. They don't make the games I buy. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Lorenzo Magnifico. Lorenzo Magnifico came out in two, 2016. It plays two to four players. It has a BGG weight of three point two nine. That's about right. Somewhere in the early threes. Um, Lorenzo de Medici, also known as Lorenzo il Magnifico, Lorenzo the Magnificent, was one of the most powerful and enthusiastic patrons of the Italian Renaissance. In Lorenzo il Magnifico, each player takes the role of the head of a noble family in a city during the Italian Renaissance. Your goal is accumulating prestige and fame to gain more victory points than the others. To do so, send your family members to different areas of town where they can obtain many achievements. In one location, they get useful resources and another development cards which represent newly conquered territories, sponsored buildings, influenced characters, or encouraged ventures. Somewhere else they activate the effects of their cards family members are not identical at the beginning of each round you roll three dice to determine out of i'll explain the game okay <laughs> here's what's awesome about the game let me just quickly tell you about the theme of the game the theme of this game is one of the greatest games you've ever played that's it that's the theme it's an amazing mechanics i don't know what the theme is it doesn't matter i don't care oh come on it's, got it's fine okay. it's fine i am a i play a family in italy during sure. during that period yeah. i have four, me- four family members <laughs> i have okay i have three family members that sure. are these three little little um cylinders uh-huh. and then i have a fourth family member that's a different color which <laughs> we all know what that means uh Jeez. that's my cousin okay uh and there are four towers that okay. are out there, right? One sure. of the towers is uh, is uh, people that are have have territories. Another yep. one has buildings. Another one has famous characters from the period, and another one has ventures that you go off and, mm-hmm. and do. And I'm going to send my minions out, and I am going to grab those things. I'm going to grab up territories because if I grab up territories, guess what? I can use those territories to generate wood or generate uh, metal or generate mm-hmm. money and or things like that. Uh, if I, and if I grab enough territories, guess what? I'm going to get a lot of victory points for that because I'm going to be the biggest landowner Mm -hmm. in, in Italy and so on and so forth. And each one of these categories has a, a similar bent, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, let's talk quickly about the basic um, mechanic of the game. So this is a worker placement game. You have four workers, um, three of them are normal workers and then one sort of special worker, which is a neutral worker, right? At the beginning of every round, this is a dice placement worker placement game, um, sort of in the realm of uh, Marco Polo. But what's amazing about this is it is a shared pool of three dice. So the first player rolls three dice, and those dice are everybody's dice for the whole round. So every one of your family members... White, black, and orange. Right. Every one of your family members has a symbol of a colored die on it. So when you place that family member, 
whatever the color die on it is whatever that die is. So if the orange die is a four, everybody's orange uh, family member is a four. And so you're all show. So if somebody rolls really badly, it's self balancing. Everybody has the same bad luck now. It's not like I roll my characters, you roll yours. We all have the same numbers that we're dealing with every round. And we're all facing the same difficult strategy choices. Right. And so you have a worker placement game, um, typical in the sense that uh, once somebody goes there, it's blocked. But a, a nice thing that Thomas spoke about is there are four with the expansion, five towers. And when you go to a tower, you're buying a card and you're building your tableau. This is just classic tableau building. Um, and when I take a card, you can't have that card. That card's and gone. And when you come to the same tower, guess what? You have to pay money to come to the same three, tower. Once, somebody, once a tower has somebody in it, one of your own or somebody else's, it costs $3 to go there again. When, and your neutral character has some nice bonuses in that you can never go to the same tower twice. But your neutral character isn't the same color as you. So your neutral character can go there. Obviously, it still has to pay the three if somebody else has gone there, but that's the way that you could go to the same tower twice. Um, now, what do the dice mean? Well, the higher on the tower, the, the higher requirement of pips on the die. So to get to the top of the tower requires a seven. Well, how is that possible? There are only six-sided dice. Well, you can always spend workers in order to... Uh, to raise the number of your dice. So if little, I, little purple servants you have that work for you. Yes. Yeah, so if I if I have a one die, but I want to place it at the seven, that's fine. I just get rid of six workers and I can place my die there. It's a one-time little bonus. Workers are an extremely valuable resource, though. They're hard to come by. You need an engine to get them, um, but they make you very flexible. And a lot of cards also have another cost. that I'll have a cost in the upper left-hand corner. In order to acquire this card, I have to spend five stone. Right. I have to spend three money. Uh, occasionally I have to have to have a minimum of five shields, five yeah. defense, and then I have to spend three of them, things like that. All of these cards often have an instant bonus as well that you get. So when you get this, I'm going to get one faith or mm -hmm. I'm going to get two money or something along those lines. So you're building your tableau. And what's fun about this is it, 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 it has a slight similarity in tapestry in terms of strategy. And like there are four tracks that you can focus on and you're going to need to focus on about two of them really well and and what's fun in me about this game is sitting down every time and trying something different and there are so many different routes to victory in this game and they're, they're all so well balanced it feels really strong to go up any track um, and to start collecting cards in a certain thing because you're going to get a huge amount of end game points for having a, you know you have a max of six cards in each of the four different sections in the game yep. and so once you finally get to six in that you unlock some pretty big stuff usually um so you're, you're building this tableau, you're choosing sort of what routes you want to focus on. And at the same time, we have this fun faith track, which is a really cool uh, mechanic in the game that I've never seen in anything else before. So uh, well, which we, what, what recently did we see that in? Actually, there was a game we were playing recently. And I was like, oh, this is just like that, where you have to ding a certain thing every round or else you get in trouble for it. It'll come to me. But there was a game we were just playing recently that has the same thing. Oh, Barrage. Barrage has this exact thing. We have to have a certain oh, yeah, amount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to have a certain amount of energy every round, and then it gets the requirements get higher every round. Yep. So you have to get faith, which is another resource in this game. Um, but you could also just totally ignore this. And what happens is there are going to be these three random era tiles that come out in every game. It's different every game. Another huge part of the randomness, in which it. is what the Pope is demanding right. of you. The Pope is going to demand things, and at the beginning of the game, you see what he's going to demand in the three different eras. Um, and there, there are uh, ramifications for not giving the Pope what he wants. So if you haven't expressed enough faith, which I'm imagining is probably just greasing the wheels a little bit, you know, giving some money to the Catholic Church. How dare you? <laughs> you then, took five years of Latin. Yeah, exactly. If you don't uh, hit the certain requirement in round one, it's three, round two, it's four, and round three, it is five. If you don't hit that requirement, you get a the opposite of a game-breaking power. You get a game-breaking negative that happens to you for the rest of the game. Like, you can never buy development cards. Or you can, you, every time you take um, workers, the servants, yeah. you can take a maximum of one. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> I mean, you just get, like, a huge game-breaking bad thing. But one of my favorite things in this game to do is to look at those things and decide which ones I'm not going to care about and just not worry about faith that age. Because guess what? If you play faith, it, it, when, you, um, when you avoid getting excommunicated, when you avoid right. taking these negatives, you go back down to zero faith and you start all over again. Right. Yeah. No, to, start, to, to appease the Pope, you have to lose all your faith. You have to give it all to him. And you start at the track again. If instead you played a game where all you wanted to do was gain faith and never yeah. lose it, you would have to endure those three right. punishments. But you know them in advance. You can look at them and go, 
Oh, I can win and also have those three negatives happen to me. And if you can, and you can get way high up on the faith track, I think there's a 30 ton points. Of points. A ton, a huge amount. Yeah, it'd, be, it'd probably be 25% of your whole score if you get all the way up there. Absolutely. Um, or you could ignore faith entirely. And by being able to ignore faith entirely, there. listen, you're always looking at the beginning of every round at 20 cards and four, five, six extra action spaces mm-hmm. that are lower on the, on the board. Everybody is staring at those same things. Everybody, remember, has the same dice to work with. So we have the same relative advantages and disadvantages. If you know that I can ignore every card that is giving faith as a bonus, Mm -hmm. I have a huge advantage because I am now targeting things that other people have to forego for a little while to, to keep racing up the hamster wheel that is faith in the game. Yeah. Um, and I've played games where I've totally ignored faith. I've played games where I've been a good altar boy. I've played f- games where, you know, you strategically go, well, I'm not going to care about this last era and you know, that's going to, you know, I'm going to get to race up there, which is a totally viable strategy. Um, there's so many fun, like, and, and one of the big things I'm going to get into in my, uh, my section today where I talk about my history with gaming is, is the concept of exploration mm. and how that's the itch that I'm always looking to scratch in, in everything I do, in all games especially, is I really want that feeling of exploration. And Lorenzo always gives me that. It always gives me this, I have this vast world of things I can try and explore. And every time I play, it feels like a totally different experience. Um, but it's not random because you're going to have eight cards in every tower in every era and those eight cards in every era are always going to be the same. The only randomness is the order they come out in, which is really fun because the more you play, the more you get to know the cards, you get to know what to expect, but the only randomness is where they're going to come out and what, what area, you know, are they going to, is it going to cost me a six, my best guy to get it or my worst guy to get it? And when is it going to come out the first half or the second half? And those are enough interesting variations and decisions that totally change the way you can build your engine. I would say that in comparison to the other games that we mentioned in this category, mm-hmm. when we talk about Great Western Trail or um, Marco, Polo. Marco Polo or things like that, I would say that this game probably plays a half hour shorter. Yeah. I think the it's a two hour game. The explanation of the game is probably ten minutes less yeah, or something totally. along those lines. Yeah. It feels clean. Mm-hmm. It feels like you know, the first time I played it, it blew my mind just by how it just felt like it had perfected like all the little edges had been sanded off of every part of medium weight games for me. And it's, it's probably less thematic. Yeah. I would say that's probably part the of the reason. The theme of this game is perfect mechanics. <laughs> that is the theme, and it's a great theme if you can find it. It could be anything. I'm, I'm, I have three pieces, and I put them in one of four columns. But I still like it. I mean, like the, it's, still, it's all very intuitive. Like The concept of if you want to go up the colony track, which means conquering different colonies, you better have a strong military because you're going to be spending your military to conquer it. So you have to go up the colony track to do that. If you want to get people to help you and they're going to give you really efficient actions and give you this great engine, you got to pay them cash. You better have money if you want to get people to help you. Um, you know, it's just, it, it, those things to me feel very thematic. They make sense. And then you also, you know, you have these, uh, one of my favorite parts of the game is these leaders. So leaders are cards you draft at the beginning of the game. So um, this is part card called sort of the expert variant, but I w- I've never played without it. Always I never play, would. Always play with drafting when you can. Yeah. So the leaders, no, I mean, just the leaders are an expert mechanic in the game or an expert variant. Oh, is that right? You could play the without them yeah, at all? They're, they're, the, the leaders are always drafted, but there's a, the variant is that you just don't play. I mean, the variant is you play with them. Um, I, so I don't always, understand these people. Yeah. Always play with it. it well, it's just, it's, it's an overhead. So sure, sure, sure. leaders are, you're going to draft four of them at the beginning of the game. Everybody's going to end up with a hand of four. And these are giant game breaking powers. I mean, these are just or either, or just huge point dumps or huge resource dumps or just like some of them are small, but the thing is, is that they have requirements to right. be able to be played. Right. So one of every different type of card or four of a certain type of card, they're going to usually have combinations of cards. So you look at these and these are helping you guide your strategy. You need these cards. I've never seen somebody win without putting at least one, if not two or three of these down. Or sometimes the have 10 faith yeah, or totally. have, have 15 bucks. So they take this sandbox of of, of victory points that you, you have so many ways of getting it and they totally guide you because the rewards at the end of, of completing these things are so huge. So you, at the beginning of the game, you just have this amazing fun, like, okay, here's my strategy. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's my thoughts. And then like, 
totally zigging and zagging throughout the game as, as, as people start taking the things you needed and you realizing you're racing for other people with things. The nice thing about these cards, though, is they always have a value. So even if you decide, well, I'm never going to achieve this, you can toss a card at any time to get this great little bonus action, which is like a little resources. It's or, called a favor. And essentially, yeah. the uh, right on the board, it says what a favor is worth. It's worth one faith. It's worth one shield. It's worth two this. It's yeah, worth two that. A, stone or a, wood, bunch of different, yeah. a bunch of different things that all... Oftentimes in the game, you will look at it and say, I absolutely, positively need two more wood to, yeah. do, to do the perfect turn for me. And mm -hmm. so I, I'm going to have to do something like that. Listen, Matt, I think, I think we've basically told people what they need to know about the base game, which yeah. is that if you have never played it, you must seek it out and you must play it. Well, it's, 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 it's as close to a lock for a, a game experience that you can have. And here's the thing. I think a lot of people pass it over because it looks like generic Euro 101, and it does. I mean, there's nothing yeah. exceptional about it when you look at it. Until it's from Simon. The only exceptional thing is if you know the designers, then you go like, well, of course, this is going to be great. It's from Simon. It's it's called Lorenzo a Magnifico. I mean, it just looks like your basic trading in the Mediterranean, you know, boring theme. There's a million of these. Oh, and now Simon's going to have theirs. How oh. good can that be? It's about I, the Medici's. Yeah, oh, I think oh, like so many fresh. people did that with the game. And it just it just happens to be a perfect 10. It just happens to be everything I'm looking for in a board game. It really is. Like it's I my favorite games, while I love heavy games, like the games that really uh that I come back to forever and are always coming to my, my favorite games of all time are usually medium weight games. And this is this is the best of them. Shall we talk about the expansion? Let's please. That's exactly what I was about to say. Let's talk about the expansion. Uh, Matt thinks that this is the perfect expansion. I, I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. Yeah, you have one problem with it. And I don't thing. disagree with that. I don't disagree with okay. that. I, it's gotten better, actually, because... Okay, so the expansion is called Houses of Renaissance. Um, expansion offers a few main things. The first thing is there is now a fifth tower. And this fifth tower is sort of the potpourri tower. <laughs> um, this is the first deck that has more cards than you'll see in a game. So at the beginning of this, every round, or at the beginning of the game, it has a deck of one, two, three. It has deck. twice as many cards. Right, 16 believe, cards, so you're going to yeah. randomly get rid of eight. So you, this is the deck where you're not going to know what you're going to see every game. So there's a little bit of randomness in there. But this deck has every type of card in it. So now what I mean by sudden, that is colors. Remember, right. one one track is one color, and the other one, and the other. Uh, this one has every kind of color, and you never know exactly what's going to come out. Right. So this throws off the amount that you can expect, and you'll always know the base amount. You're always going to have at least eight of each type, but now you might have twelve in a round of these certain of, of green cards or Which yellow is cards. Particularly amazing when you've played this game a lot, you start to be able to say, okay, well, I know these two cards haven't come out yet, so they're going to come out in the next round, and you can start to sort of plan around those things and at a certain point that advanced planning uh can feel a little rote the fifth tower changes all of that up in a really great way yeah fifth tower is great it, it there's and what one of my favorite things that a expansion does is no rules extra overhead yep this is just a, the same thing again that you, you've already you don't have to teach it it's, it's just if you know how to use the other ones you know how to use this yeah. one and I would say that's the third best thing about this. Yeah, totally. Um, the next uh, big thing is, uh, well, I guess the two things you're talking about are these two, the bidding for resources yeah. well, and let, families. Let's, let's also say that it, it makes the game play five players, which yep. is a very important Which is massive. I mean, being able to play this game with five players is like a dream. And it doesn't, I don't think it adds much length to the game. No. And I don't think it uh, slows things down. Some groups, you know, the, Three and four people are what they play with. For us, we're our numbers can often be nine. Yeah, we can often have nine or fives. ten, and five and, and a five player game becomes a godsend. Then, yeah. especially one that's good. So this is my favorite thing about it. So, and this is where you can see you can see the design team of these Italian geniuses, all who all work together, coming together and taking ideas from things they've used in the past. They added in the game breaking powers from Marco Polo. My favorite thing about Marco Polo is when you're teaching the game and watching people who've never played it before as you explain to them the game-breaking powers that you are going to be choosing in reverse turn order. Because and you've each told person, them the whole game. You've told them the game, and now each single power you teach them sounds so broken, and then you tell the next one that that sounds so broken, and each one just is so fun because they're just wildly broken. And I like to tell them in that order, too. Yeah. I, like to, I like to move my way up and eventually get to the guy that... Oh, every single one of your dice, you never have to roll them. Yeah, you don't roll they dice. They magically become whatever number you want them to be. <laughs> yeah. You know how you have to pay resources to go here? Yeah. 
you give them to him now. He that guy, that player at the table gets all those resources. Like it's just crazy. So they took that ridiculous game breaking uh, uh, asymmetrical powers and they added into this game, which is like taking my favorite dessert and putting it at the end of my favorite meal now. And the way you acquire these, the way it is decided which one you get. Like, by the way, could have just been magic. Could have just been reverse turn order. They, or they could or, have just or done could that. have been come up with come up with ten and everybody gets two or right. something like that. They came up with something that I've never seen in a board game before, and is a mini game you play before the game starts. And you are bidding for these things. You are bidding for them, but what are you bidding? Your starting resources. <laughs> so there are these tracks. And there is actually a little mini worker placement game you play before the game starts. There are all these tracks and each track will randomly get attached to a different house. And under the tracks are a list of starting resources. And, and the bottom of the list is a lot. And at the top of the list is not very many. And so in, in, in player order, everybody takes one of their workers and places it on one spot underneath one house. So if I put something on the bottom spot, I am saying that if nobody bids higher than me, yeah. I am going to get this game breaking power and I'm going to get four wood and three stone yeah, like so and many one resources. shield and this right. and that, the other thing. But guess what? Somebody's going to want that game breaking power I have. So they're going to go one space above mine or maybe two right. spaces above mine. And suddenly they're saying, oh, I want that power. And in order yeah. to get that power, I'm willing to take just two stone and a wood. Yeah. And so anytime somebody places on the same tower as you, it becomes your turn again, and you must place somewhere else or higher on that same track. And so you get basically a self-balancing game of players deciding how valuable the game-breaking power is by betting on themselves that they can still win while starting with a handicap of like no starting resources. Whichever one, whichever game breaking power this particular group on this particular day thinks is the best, yeah. the person who gets it is going to be really, really resource drained at the yeah. beginning of the game. And that's, and that's what's really fun too is like I've played it where we've had games where everybody has their own idea of what's super broken and you'll have somebody like throw their pawn in the middle of the track on one of them and nobody ever goes there and they're just like oh nobody thought that was good i thought that was crazy good like damn i could i could have had so many more starting resources nobody cared about that or you just set it at the right value and people go like okay that's about right you can i'll, I'll, I'll see how you do with that so combining your starting resources with your game breaking power yeah. and having that be the decider it's is genius. Absolutely. Brilliant. I would like to add that to Gaia to Gaia Project. How how is that not in almost every game? It should be in every asymmetrical game because you'll never have anybody ever on BGG saying that the powers are broken because you self balancing. It's self balancing. Yeah. If they're okay, then that person starts with nothing, and now it's not broken anymore. Good which luck. By, which, by the way, let's say that up until around 2000 or so, um, Euro games, almost all of them had auction mechanisms in them. Auction was a very, very common thing, and it was common for a reason. It's because auctions are a self balancing element. If people are bidding on A versus B, uh, there was a game called Princess of the Ren uh, Princess of Florence yeah. that was great for that. The gestures are better than every other piece. But guess what? You're bidding twelve hundred florin for them when you can get a park or you can get yeah. a lake for for three hundred or four hundred florin. It balances itself, so that's yeah. wonderful. And I mean, like even just starting with a ton of opening resources is almost worth taking a crappy power with sometimes because it's it's such a huge advantage to have Absolutely. so many resources at the beginning of this game. Um, so yeah, and then the last thing uh, we'll talk about in the in expansion is the secret tokens, which is a new resource in the game, something you can get yes. as a favor. And yeah, I agree. Uh, Tom, Tom will tell you his thoughts on yeah. that. But look, uh, I, this is a well-oiled machine. This game is uh, nigh perfect. And the secret tokens, when you get them in the game, and there are many ways to get them w in the expansion, um, they give you, you look on the other side and you have a little ability. Like get you, can get, you can get something for them. Um, but they're not all equal. They, Some are just definitely like look yeah. here's two one says three workers one says two in this is a game of inches this is a game where the difference between two and three workers can be vast yeah. and for it randomly to give you one instead of the other to me is a little bit of a, a, a i wish the game didn't have that because it doesn't really have luck in that sense too much and some of them like these development cards that allow you to do a production at value three in one of your cards like well a, a crazy thing is that when this was released 
they never they never explained what these symbols mean. And for about a year, we we nobody knew what these meant. People had there was forums that I was on on BGG, and we were like, "Here's what I think," and we all like we had a poll deciding what we agreed. Well, you and I we we looked at these. We bought this at Essen, and yeah. we we looked at it, and we were we we couldn't figure it out. No, but for a year afterwards, finally, the designers recently released a fact that only came out with the new deck of cards, which we'll talk about in a second, the Paizo uh, expansion. Um, but yeah, for a long time, people had no idea what some of these even symbols meant on this, so it was hard to really gauge how strong or weak they were because we were kind of taking guesses at what any of them did. And end story is they're, they're not broken because they're not wildly different, yeah, yeah. but they're different enough that it does a little bit tinge what is already a pretty perfect game. Yeah. What I will say about them is that, that along with these secret tokens, there are also, um, how would I put it? There are also a lot of different mechanisms whereby the secret tokens themselves are an economy. Mm-hmm. There totally. are there are leader cards that require them. Yeah, there so are sometimes you spend that, them without even getting the benefit. There are cards in the fifth tower that can come up that require them yep. to be spent. Mm-hmm. In that sense, I think it mitigates it because I think a lot of people are going to be hanging on to those yeah. tokens. Yeah, some spending them is often a mistake. Yes, exactly right. So so that that's the that's the caveat. Uh, not a big one. Uh, it's still absolutely amazing. So the last expansion, which uh, which only Tell came out, it. a I few don't months even know ago. about it. So this is the Paizo expansion. This was a stretch goal that was a part of the Lorenzo Il Magnifico digital game on Steam. So yes, there is a digital game on Steam. Uh, if you kickstarted it. You paid for it then. I believe I paid $12 for it or something. You can now get it on Steam. It plays Mac or PC. It's $14.99. It is a very faithful translation of the game and a very fun way you can play online. You can play with other people. You could also, it's a great way to learn the game. My only bummer is like a lot of these times and, and through the ages is, is an example of it, even though I think it's the best possible version of a digital board game where they, they don't just make it look like the board game. So it looks like a bunch of bill- you have to like learn the interface and it's unfortunate. I, they're they're gussing it up. I think they think people will be bored by just looking at a board, but like you almost have to relearn the game because now I have to learn like what you're you, there's just a, I know what I know how to play this game like but even, when even I even through the ages is a little bit no like through that, the ages right? takes some time yeah through yeah. the ages is not is is like I yeah. I know how to play that game but it took me a while to figure out how to play the video game that's why I love Twilight Struggle yeah, it looks exactly like yeah. the game so look Lorenzo is there if you want to try it I think it's a great way to give it a whirl actually you'll definitely learn the game um and uh, the AI is not bad and playing against other players is pretty easy um, but anyway when you supported that on Kickstarter which I did because it's one of my favorite games of all time um, you got a brand new deck of cards um now this is not a replacement deck of cards you do not get rid of the cards and play with these instead this is much like the fifth tower wherein you mix these cards in with the decks and every game you get rid of eight and you play with half the deck oh that's great um it's great in a couple senses um obviously more cards is great um i i there's some talk about balance on them i I haven't played with them yet so i don't know um that's, also, that's the worry when it, when a game is, is so perfectly balanced yeah. already. That's well, a worry, right? And, but here's the main thing, though, that, that why I'm not like dying to throw them in is that a huge part of this game is knowing the cards and knowing what's going to come out, right? True. So if I'm building a strategy, especially in the era three cards, which are a lot about end game scoring, if I'm building a strategy, knowing, you know, part of this game is I know every card will come out. It's just about when it comes out. But now not knowing if a card's going to come out at all, I think could be a little dangerous. So there are a couple of, they actually suggest three variants in the rules for this. Um, the first one is uh, the future cards are visible. So at the beginning of the game, everybody gets to see what's going to be there. Now that, that that's and then a, it gets shuffled in when the third deck happens. No, well, yeah. So you 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 yeah, you don't know the order that every area is coming out, but before sure. the game, everybody gets to look at the decks, okay. and you all know what's coming throughout the whole game. That's a bit of overhead. Like let's all pass the decks around and like sort of memorize them. <laughs> but um, let, but let's realize that that if you are adapting one of these variants, it's because you are experienced in this game already, and yes. so so I don't think the the overhead is too much of a concern because it, the only reason you'd be doing this in the first place is I know all the cards in the game, and I don't want I right. don't want the new cards to mess up what I already know. Sure. The other one is just mix them in randomly and take eight out, and the last one is build your perfect deck which I think could be interesting. It'd be fun to look at it and be like, yeah. you know what, these cards, let, let's have a super strong de- deck where every card feels super powerful. I think there'd be a kind of a fun version of that. Um, I think you can get this deck uh, 
through certain ways. I think it's going to be available at Spiel. There's ways to order it online, I believe, right now. Um, it's definitely not a must-buy. I do think the expansion is a must-buy. Um, Agreed. The game is fifty dollars on, on your OLGSs, and the expansion's forty. So it's 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 a big buy-in. Um, you are great with the vanilla game here. I could not recommend it higher. Play the vanilla game for a year, and then yeah. when you start to to get a little tired, get the expansion, but and it's it's a brand new game all if, over again. If 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 you already want to buy it, and you're like, I got ninety bucks, I would buy both. <laughs> I think. I mean, it's just it's so good. I mean, I don't know. It's you're not gonna you won't have made a mistake. So, Maddie, the question we have to come down to: the is, juice is worth the squeeze. <laughs> <laughs> Tiny squeeze, gallons of juice, all the juice, all, right. all the juice you'll ever need. I personally so, have a gorgeous insert for my game. Stop I have stop talking. About I have uh, I have blinged it out as much as possible. I got this gorgeous set. I'll look up what it's. Uh, it's uh, a Polish company that made this beautiful wood crafted set for all the cars. And they're in and they're in tiny little oh, plastic, them all, plastic yeah. sleeves. Plastic well, sleeves. Of course, I've sleeved them. I'm not an animal. Uh, my cards are sitting in a greasy McDonald's, <laughs> McDonald's <laughs> yeah, bag. Exactly loose, bent. Just uh, McDonald's yeah, bag sitting at the bottom of uh, of the box, which basically I put in the game shelf slash dumpster. <laughs> It's, it's a dual use yeah. device for me. Can't handle it. Uh, anyway, so as you can tell, sort of a so so mixed review yeah. for Lorenzo Il Magnifico. Check it out. You absolutely must. Yeah, last thing last thing. I just I I chose this game because if if somebody came up to me and was like, You love board games, I can buy one. I'm I'm telling you to buy this. I think it's fair. Yeah, because because it's middle because it's medium weight and almost anybody can access it. And I I, I think I would like to live in a world where this is considered the greatest medium weight game because I think it deserves that. I think it definitely should be in the top hundred, no question about it, and way way higher than that. 